Welcome to the next installment of the VAMS Mini School. This section is titled Songwriting. My name is Graham Wyman and I'm the program coordinator with the Vancouver Adapted Music Society. Today I'm joined again by my partner in crime, Simon Paradis. How's it going, Simon? It's going good. You know, I'm just working on uh, putting on my extra 30 pounds of COVID weight out here on the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I know, right? You know, there's not a shortage of food or anything like that right now in your life. It's my jab of the hut period. <laughs> exactly. That was Chico. Oh, what's the little Jabba's pet? Chico would be, you know. I don't even know why you know details about Star Wars and not privy to, man. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, yeah, big nerd on that front. But we are here for music, so why don't we get started? Okay. So, today with songwriting, Simon just had a little something he wanted to say before we jumped in. The joke about poverty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we were kind of laughing about songwriting. Again, we're, we're there's, these are just tools. I, that... I, yeah, I don't mean to discourage anyone by making a joke about indentured poverty or anything. Just um, what we offer is um, it, it's just a list of things that are, you know, kind of like an approximate guideline that should make it easier for people to get interested in songwriting um, by creating a process that's specific to them and how they feel would best suit their interests. And so we made a list of some, you know, constructive suggestions of things that might help the process for people who are just wading into it out of the blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so again, this will be part one of a two part lecture. Um, we, we thought it would actually be one, but the more we actually delve into this, we felt we wouldn't be able to really hammer it out in 45 minutes. Um, and again, this is just a taste of the mini school courses that VAMS will be providing, hopefully in 2021. Nice. So part one, I guess the main thing that we kind of thought to start with is, you know, you, we want to get people or songwriters to ask themselves to write or ask them, ask the right questions. Now, whether that means what does songwriting mean to you and specifically what is your intention with whatever piece you're writing. So that, I mean, again, we feel with songwriting, I mean, if you're somewhat disingenuous about what you're writing about, it's gonna come across probably in the music, first and foremost. Yeah, you don't want to be the feeling exemplified through whatever you're doing. No, of course, of course not. And then on top of that, the main thing would be what piques your interest? Again, we were, looking on that question of what's your intention what you know know what you write about and sorry go ahead oh no i was just agreeing with you and say i was going to say that yeah in in terms of you know a big part of what we're going to discuss lyrically is writing what you know yeah. and i think that it serves people to you know ask questions that makes them uh, as fully self-actualized as an artist as possible so that then when they do go to write something they're representing their own voice and their intent and it, it becomes more of a universal product for the listener. Yeah. And, and we were even somewhat joking last night, but I mean, if you love the rain, write a song about the rain. Go for it. And it doesn't, as we'll get into that, you know, not everything needs to be informed by the harmony and the melody, depending on the sentiment of the song. You can write things in an ironic sense as well, where it can be one example we talked about was the song you are my sunshine yeah. that everyone loves to sing it's like an inspirational get you out of the doldrums kind of tune and if you read those lyrics yeah. there's some of the saddest lyrics in folk music history but people love that you are my sunshine yeah my only sunshine and it's terrible and i mean that yeah, especially written over very happy chords yeah you know it's it's uh very ironic in that instance. Or then again, look at Weird Al Yankovic, how he's made a career of uh, doing parodies, but, you know, writing about ironic topics that have to do with that piece. Yeah, but it, luckily he's got the music reference of a pop hit that he's making, he's turning into satire. So yeah. everyone gets to, you know, everyone can think of Michael Jackson's Beat It while they're listening to Weird Al Yankovic's Eat It. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So the next part that we wanted again, and this is probably, at least for myself approaching songwriting is one of the main points is how do you want your music to connect 
to who you're, you're the listener. Yeah. And I mean, that obviously has an idea with harmony and, um, and lyrically as well. But, um, you know, without that, again, goes back to that intention, you know, how, how, how do you expect someone to really connect to your piece if you can't, you know, want that or try to connect to them and to a certain level as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, when we start talking about lyrics, I can get into an idea I had with regards to um, sort of what a constructive function of lyric writing is. Um, but it's true, you know, you want you want to be able to create something that um, engages the listener on multiple levels, you know, both the musical and the lyrical and also the performance level, if you're also going to be the performer of the tune. You know, yeah. it's, it's like a three pronged um, approach. No, for sure. And so, why don't we jump into the lyrics then? That's a good segue. Can I just read from the um, from yeah. the thing we've got there for now? Yeah. So, lyrically, um, these are a few ideas I jotted down. Write what you know. A big part of lyric writing is creating a sense of the universal out of something personal. Essentially, what you're doing is you're building a bridge that you and the listener can meet halfway across on. Mm -hmm. is, is a good way of thinking about it. So some people like to approach that, whether it be a personal point of view story or a fable or a parable, you know, something that has a moral to it or, you know, a, 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 some message that you feel serves a function of the time. Um, or maybe it's just like, you know, bumper sticker anthemic statements like, you know, we will rock you or we're not going to take it. You know, it's you can you can construct something based on those values. And if the listener can find something familiar in the construct, they will likely engage with it. Uh -huh. So, um, as an I, sorry, I don't mean to, am I taking up too much air in the room here by talking? No, not at all. Okay. No, no, I've got an idea after just touching on what you said. Okay. So, um, one, Graham and I were discussing this lyric fact. And one thing we wanted to put down was that, you know, it's good at this point to suggest a couple of tools for beginners. One is start by doing steady journaling, you know, keep a notepad or digital recorder by your bed because sometimes ideas come at the most lucid times, like when you're just awaking out of a dream um, and, and get right, get used to the act of writing and thinking about the meter or the prosody of phrase of the lyrics you're writing. That'll inform sort of the melodies you come up with when you're doing a construction of some kind. Mm -hmm. No, and I touch on that with clients, you know, when we're up at the studio at GF, you know, you always want to have some type of source that you can, you know, use to capture an idea, because especially when you get that inspiration in the moment, you know, I found, you know, I, I, I used to be one of those people who was like, oh, I'll remember that idea. I'll remember. Oh, man. Idea. Yeah. That's now, a and, you know, and in that vision of it being what I that original idea is, and then I can never really capture no. that same sentiment or that exact the way that I originally found what I was trying to convey. Yeah, out. and I would say conversely, in those moments, one of the things about having a tool that can allow you to capture your idea in the moment is also um, making a deal with yourself that you won't actually be a self editor until you've had a lucid section where you're allowed to actually get the idea out without any editing. Just like, you know, you have, might have an idea that's going to be about like, maybe you're writing a song about kale, you know, something as mundane as that, right? About boiled kale. Yeah. Sounds like it's not going to have a lot of poetry involved. Maybe you come up with this great idea about kale. Don't edit yourself. Just get that idea out on paper or sing it into a recorder or something. And then worry about going back and molding that clay once you have the idea down. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, never, I, never, um, uh, you know, make sure that your bath water isn't filled with babies when you start to discard it, you know? Yeah. And I, I like that part about the editing process as well. So, so you gave that you mentioned just quickly there, Simon, because I mean, I, I, I back when I was in college, I would always have, luckily enough, I had a, a roommate and bandmate who was in the songwriting program. And so when I would jot down things, I'd always go to him to kind of get, you know, kind of more of a condensed idea on maybe what would work and what wouldn't. And I'm just wondering, maybe you could also maybe talk about your process with you and Kara, because I'm sure you guys work together quite closely and getting how things work that way. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, my last two CDs, I would, uh, well, my last three CDs, um, which uh, I wasn't really doing a lot of writing until I had my accident and landed in a wheelchair. And uh, 
I, as Graham has mentioned, my partner, my wife, Kara Stanley, is herself a very successful writer and has written both fiction and nonfiction and a lot of great, oops, sorry, a lot of great song lyrics. So she for sure is my like resident cleanup artist because I'll get these gobbledygook ideas and then I'll wheel over to her office across the hall and be like, so Kara, how can we turn this into a nice lyric? Like she's the one who can find the prosody and the art out of some clumsy limerick that comes out of my brain, you know? Yeah. So again, that's a tool, you know, you don't necessarily pigeonhole yourself where you have to do everything yourself. Yeah, actually, no, that's true. You know, I mean, it's, uh, I think it, um, a lot of people nowadays in the industry feel the burden of having to be like the do it yourself guy on every level. So, you know, there's a lot of CDs that are coming out by independent singer songwriters where they're the, the performer, the writer, the engineer, and the producer. And in a weird way, once you get to the end of that process, in those cases, even if the person is a really talented writer and musician or a strong singer of some kind, you do feel like at the end of those albums, like you're looking into an aquarium of all the same species of fish. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't get that. Like music, I think the essence of music for me has always been the an art form that can be made pliable by multiple people in time all at once you know what i mean you can have a band of five people that are sharing musical ideas in real time and developing amazing things that you yourself with your own two ears wouldn't have stumbled across had you not had like the synergistic um spices that come with other people's inclinations you know and i think that a large part of you know creative fulfillment and individuality comes out also of being able to let go of you being the only person who can inform anything and be able to deal with having other people kind of, you know, help you mold your clay. No, and just reiterating that point, like the probably the most creative time I felt was again, back at this band that I was with that I was kind of, you know, pushing, but right. it was more of, um, you know, I wanted everyone's input from the Oh group. yeah, and I think that bands when everyone in a band feels like they're actually a contributor to the creative output, I think bands have a generally, you know, more life to them, you know, as opposed to just supporting one artist or one kind of process of songwriting. And they're invested. In yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. And I mean, I'll just give an example. Um, uh, you know, look at what happened to Pink Floyd. Look at what happened to Pink Floyd. You know, what, you know, I hate, I mean, one of my favorite groups and, so much respect for Roger Waters, but he kind of tore the heart and soul out of the group. And, you know, therefore he left, you know, and then the band actually got back together after he left. <laughs> yeah, the, the band was able to retain the name. It was pretty contentious. I think there was a lot of legalese that went into David Gilmore and company being able to retain the name. Yeah, so again, that, that just re goes back to that point uh, if, again, if it's your project and you see it that vision that way and you know exactly what you want, that's fine. Yeah. But I've just found personally that the other option works a lot better as well. Yeah. And I think it teaches you a certain skills as an artist where you're comfortable making yourself feel a little bit more transparent and vulnerable. Mm hmm. You yeah. know, and, and I think that's an important thing for performers. You know, if you want to get up in front of a crowd and sing your song or play your tune, then I think, you know, you need to make yourself emotionally available for the people who are going to watch mm -hmm. and being able to actually, you know, consult with others and have a sense of democracy around the output of a given piece of, of music is an important skill. It teaches you a lot about yourself for yeah. one thing, and it teaches you a lot of language about how to deal with other musicians in a transparent way where you can you figure out the right language for evoking a constructive addition to something you know and to be able to take and own criticism as well which okay. is very difficult when you're doing your own art well and i mean it's tough i think that um definitely musicians are a crazily self-critical type very much like you know creative writers i think that both both stripe of artists really drag themselves through the mud in terms of their abilities. You know, yeah. you'll very rarely meet a writer who's like, I love everything I've written. <laughs> and I, I, I bet I wager paper money on anyone who knows a single musician in their crowd. Who's like, I 
fucking love every note I play. <laughs> I, I apologize. You can beep that out when you're editing. Yeah, no, I will. Don't worry. I've okay. got little notes here. <laughs> okay, thank you. I apologize for my dirty mouth. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, it's like uh, I've, I've spent my whole life constantly evaluating myself in the context of, well, I'm, you know, there's a reason why I never had like this great takeoff professional career because, you know, that – that would have happened had I been a better player or a better writer. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, you set up that equivalency with yourself yeah. and you know, and even the best musicians I know who are like crazy talented, those are guys I played with at jams. And they'll look over at me at some point and be like, sorry, man, I didn't mean to do that. And yeah. you're kind of like, everything you did was brilliant. I'm not really <laughs> sure what you're talking about. And they're like, no, no, no. I wanted to go for this other thing and it didn't quite happen. And you're like, are like, you crazy? Everyone's uh, losing their mind. I know, you know, my jaw's on the floor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like those people walk amongst us. And the reason why they got so good is because they had this little voice in their head that was like, maybe that's not good enough. Yeah. Maybe that's not good enough. Like, And it's a psychotic thing to listen to. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to writing music, and composing and being an artist you have to make sure that that voice doesn't come into the scene too quick yeah you know you want to gather ideas and resources and have them ready and available for that voice to come along and be like i don't like that word i don't like that note i don't like that chord you know and then and then you can befriend it mm -hmm. and use it as a tool as opposed to making it a hurdle that you never jump over if that voice is what starts the process of writing songs you will never write a whole song because yeah. you're going to say something or play something that makes you go, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and the other thing too is owning that as well. Like you're not going to be satisfied with everything you do. I mean, I'll That's take it. it on a different level, just mixing, not necessarily songwriting, but right. you know, when, when is a mix engineers, there's, there's a photo is when is the mix engineers job done? And it's a skeleton over a mixing console, right? You're exactly, never going right. yeah. to be satisfied. All right, so moving on now, we talked about the lyrical content a bit. Why don't okay. we go into the harmony? Can I can I read off the yeah. page again? Yeah, no, I you Simon did a Simon sent me a manifesto. <laughs> I, a small novella of yeah. songwriting ideas, and I apologize. It's a oh, long great winded stuff. affair. No, so no, please go ahead. So harmonically, here are a few of thoughts on a harmonic approach. One, use your ear as you guide. Use your ear as your guide. Sorry. How you listen and hear are the tendencies that inform your invention. If your ear enjoys it, then you should most likely develop that theme. That being said, remember our cat and mouse game. Okay, sorry, I, I got to back up here. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, the, uh, the whole engine of music is based on... Um, sorry, something that we have as humans with ears... There's something called natural resolution. Yeah. And that whole, it's an interesting idea. It means that basically the physics of our hearing um, can be a predictor as to how we deal with tension in sound and release in sound. Mm -hmm. So it can be as easy as taking a look at that scale we all know from the sound of music, that do, a deer, a female, deer, ray, a drop of golden sun. That's the major scale. Yeah. Now in that scale, there are a few notes that are known as stable notes and the ear likes those notes and feels at ease with those notes. But when it's on other notes in the scale, it predicts that those notes are either going to move up or move down in the scale to one of those more stable notes. Now, given that that's how the ear recognizes the scale and its trajectory, the same can be applied to chords because chords are built on the notes and scales. So you can have stable chords and unstable chords. And what you're trying to do with the listener is you're trying to set up a game of cat and mouse with that whole process of tension and release. So you can create rhythmically or harmonically or lyrically, you can create a tension and then you can create a release point in your song where the listener can be like, oh man, that's fabulous. I was yeah. waiting for that, you know? And those are the things that the mind grabs. Okay, so that's my cat and mouse game. Some things should make the listener uncomfortable. As long as you can give them something comfortable to return to. Essentially, building tension builds excitement. Resolving tension provides a much needed release for the listener. Every genre of music has its own tools of creating that tension and release. These elements define the style. So like the way flamenco has a distinct palette of textures is the same with the blues. Both styles are effective vehicles for telling stories. 
Yeah. Sorry. No, I, no, no, no. I agree with that. Blah, blah, blah. No, 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 not at all. No, I'm just, I was thinking just about, um, the, the, again, that whole idea of release, because we kind of touched on that in our other mini school clip as well. So in the sense of those tracks that we were building or had tension built. And again, I think we should also point out, it doesn't necessarily, I guess, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll save that for our form when we're coming up later. Maybe okay, I don't want gotcha. to jump far ahead. But um, the other thing that we were talking about, and this kind of touches in with this tension building, is another interesting technique that you can use harmonically is um, there's certain bands that would actually invert a traditional chord in, say, a scale. And instead of having it in that traditional major chord, actually, you flip it into a minor yeah. as well. So that, again, is another very interesting way of, again, building tension, but having it released to almost a chord that you wouldn't actually think would just be a release. It's yeah. kind of adding to that tension. In a way, it's like um, being more articulate with like the cinematographic model, you know, like when you go to see a movie and the movie has the scene where the man and woman are breaking up and maybe it's even raining outside. And the guy who composes the, the background music for the movie decides at this point to make it like womp, 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 womp in the orchestra. It's almost like you're putting too many layers of the same vibe on it becomes too heavy it's like oh this is all just sadness on top of sadness on top of sadness and i think that as graham was mentioning you know you have the ability like we were talking about earlier with the whole you are my sunshine song you actually have the ability of creating a certain amount of tension in irony with regards to the tonalities you're using and the themes of your lyrics yeah. so you can be singing a sad song and playing in a happy major tempo that <laughs> makes everyone think from a distance that it's in a happy song. Yeah. Or you can do the other thing where you can have a totally happy song, but it's in like a dreary minor kind of thing where it's like a funeral procession and people listening to it are like, man, this song must just be about heartbreak. But really it's, you know, it's a great declaration. No, and I've, I've had debates. We were talking about this yesterday as well, but um, I've had debates over pieces that, you know, sonically as you said harmonically it's very you know based off a of minor very dark but the lyrics at least to me are hopeful or you know very happy but again this all goes back to i think you know beating a dead horse here but it's subjective to the listener what does yeah. the listener really get out of it and and also the importance of the writer being able to use their own ear as a guide Mm -hmm. in terms of how those pieces are being presented, whether they're all working in concert with each other to give yeah. a specific, like, consistent message that, you know, serves the trajectory of the song, mm -hmm. or, you know, is the listener involved more in some elements and taken out by other elements? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's it's a big job. It's a, it, it really, I think uh, for most people, it's establishing a process that is specific and constructive to them and just hammering that process on a regular basis yeah. will give people the tools they need to be able to discover what their voice is within a musical framework. Yeah, and I guess maybe we'll just take a little aside here, but that process, like you will find and develop your process as you start doing this more consistently. Yeah. It's just like practicing your instrument. This is no different. Totally. Totally. And um, in the same light as practicing your instrument, you know, imitation is a valuable tool for a songwriter. So, so I just, I'm just using that as a segue point. I hope yeah. we're okay with that. No, yeah, totally. So, no. you know, there's an old saying that it's like amateurs borrow professional steel. <laughs> and that can really be applied to form because people hmm. can't copyright a harmonic pro progression. They can copyright a melody line and a lyrical um libretto uh invention rhythm but oh, what say that again rhythm as well uh, uh well yeah rhythm both harmonics and rhythm are like um free from anyone having mechanical property rights over them mm -hmm. so you can actually take ready-made chord progressions that have served for millions of songs like the standard go-to rock and roll three chord progression of the one chord the four chord and the five chord all of them being major and you can write a million songs going forth as long as the melody lines are your own idea 
you yeah. know, and lyrically you're not saying Louis Luai, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. No, no. So no, it's, again, it's I, I I always So you don't have to people don't have to worry about their individuality if their harmonic structure is something that they've heard appear in other contexts. Yeah. You know? And that's something that inspires me as well when I do at least, you know, my instrumental writing yeah. is, you know, I'll hear something and you know what, I'll, I'll dissect it to a certain degree. I'll pick out what I really enjoy out of it, change things, but like really take that as like almost like a stepping stone moving forward. Yeah. And that's I think that's a, the very beginning. And I think that's a big tool to add to the arsenal of the tools that you need to be an effective songwriter. One of them is critical listening. You know, it's being able to listen to the things you love the best and say, okay, within the songs I love the best, these are the things that I love the best within those songs, you know, and realize, okay, that's, it's that four minor chord that brings me back to this tune every time or, you know, like little, it, it's, it's a lot like cooking, you know, there's going to be a certain spaghetti sauce that you favor over other ones. Spice. And it's going to have to do with the spices and how the process goes. And you're going to find it's the same with the songs you love, you know figure out what the spices are in the gumbo and then go to town on that. And I'm going to do a little plug here for Reimagine Radio. So if you want to find out more about critical listening, there is a podcast on our SoundCloud page, Reimagine Radio. Me and uh, uh, one of my old bandmates from Berkeley or who was nice. in the engineering program, we talked about critical listening. So if you want to find some tools and techniques, you can... Uh, you can go check that out again. It's Reimagine Radio on SoundCloud. Nice. Now, why don't we jump into the music DNA? Well, uh, I think we touched upon this. I'll read Bro. out from it, but we, I think we touched upon some of this stuff. Yeah, but, the natural uh, resolution. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, I'll, I'll give it a, I'll give it a read though. Yeah. So, music DNA. A big part of all music is akin to a game of cat and mouse with the human ear. Without going into too much theory stuff, the human ear has a tendency that is described as natural resolution. It's an intrinsic preference to how tension gets resolved. A melodic example would be the simple scale we all know from the sound of music. I sang that before. There are seven degrees to the major scale, and the ear is prone to certain stable notes and where unstable notes resolve. Mm -hmm. Certain resting notes are the root, the third, and the fifth degree of the major scale. So why don't we just kind of take a quick aside just to explain what that means to our listeners that don't necessarily know what a full scale is. Yeah, okay. So the full scale, we can say, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do, which was sung a little flat there, sorry. <laughs> but uh, the first note is do, which would be the tonic of the scale. So if I was singing that scale in the key of C, do would be C. Yeah, or the root being one. Or the root being one. So do, re, mi. Mi is the major third, which is also a stable note that makes you feel like you're within the chord tones of the scale. Yeah. Um, and stable meaning that the ear doesn't wish that note to move from that spot. Yeah. And then fa, sol. So sol is the fifth degree, or what's known as the perfect fifth, if people have a little bit of uh, music knowledge who are chiming in here. Uh, and so the root, the tonic, the major third, and the fifth, the perfect fifth of that scale are t stable tones that the ear can actually rest on without expecting there to be movement from them. Mm -hmm. um, all the other notes, the two, the four, the second degree, the fourth degree, the sixth degree, and the seventh degree, which is also known as the leading tone, yeah. all of those notes wish to either move up or down to, their, to a, a stable conclusion. Yeah, the resolution. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, make sure we no. have a well-rounded knowledge of what we're talking about here. Yeah, and I would recommend there's a lot of references online for people to do an R&D to get a simple, basic idea of music theory. And it's very handy. And it will teach you how to discover chords out of scales and have fun and be free with a lot. You know, that knowledge can be a powerful tool when coming up with, like, you know, small distinctions between what you're doing and what other people are doing. And you know what I'll do? There's a website that I'll attach underneath the video um, in the description area called musictheory.net. And that is basically what I kind of direct all my new clients when they're starting to get interested in harmony. So that'll be in the comments or the description area. Yeah. And it would also befit someone if they're getting into writing, um, 
to be comfortable with a harmonic instrument as well. Like whether you can sit at a piano and play chords or play chords on a guitar or a ukulele or a banjo or a mandolin, anything where you can play more than one note at a time to help ground a melodic idea, it's an important thing to have because you don't want to have to get on the phone and call an accompanist every time you have a song idea. Yeah. That'll get expensive. <laughs> it's way cheaper to buy a guitar and take lessons from Graham. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, once we're back up at GF, for sure. Yeah, a, a little walk around the park plug for you there. Yeah, exactly, right? So I'm just taking another look here. We talked about imitation as a tool. Um, was there anything you want? No, you got the amateurs. And then, yeah, stable, unstable chords. Yeah, I think we've kind of... I think actually we touched on it and we've done it kind of a couple of times leading up to that point too. So yeah. I think the reference is there. So do we yeah. want to go on to the melodic stuff here? Yeah, let's do this. Okay. And this is Simon's wheelhouse. I, we were talking yesterday and this is one part I like, I do enjoy it, but it's just, it, it, this is the most difficult for me to kind of, I guess, realize in my musical compositions. Right. Which again, like everyone has their own like their own um, strengths. This is probably the one that I need to do more practice on. Yeah, no, and I think it, what it comes from is being comfortable to sing. Mm -hmm. If you do a lot of just vocalization of songs, you know, not not writing original melodies, but just practicing a lot of singing actually makes you more lucid when it comes to coming up with melodic ideas. Mm -hmm. There are some writers historically that have written strictly from melodic information. Mm -hmm. uh, it was especially a big thing when people were writing symphony orchestras back in the day, you know, it was like, or, or big band music where uh, the principal theme actually is a single line of music that's played by a single instrument or sung. And then all, all the harmony comes up from what's called polyphony, which is basically a whole slew of single lines of notes that are stacked together that create a harmonic sound. Mm -hmm. So, okay, melodically. So this is uh, on, a, on, a, on a creative front. This is where your own creative labor becomes fully realized. The trick being to reconcile the lyrical content with the tone and tension of the melody. If you're new to songwriting, keeping this element simple is most effective. Try to imagine your song as a nursery rhyme or like a melody kids would sing while skipping rope. Usually lots of strong material is der derived from this simple approach. And... Um, also, coming up with melodic ideas, like I said, you don't actually have to be someone who's writing from a melodic idea first. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people who play acoustic guitar, myself included, will first come up with a chord progression they really like, and then they will apply a melody to that chord progression after writing the chord progression. That technique is called pantonal writing and is taught in its subject at certain music schools across Canada as a way to compose, you know, where you... You come up with a harmonic structure first, then you overlay a melodic structure on top of it. And I found that to be actually the most effective way for me to write. I rarely wake up with like a la 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 kind of thing going on in my head because I just don't hear music that way. I hear, I hear rhythmic and harmonic events primarily mm -hmm. and melodic things are kind of like after the fact. No, and I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. I, yeah. I, I've, I don't think I've ever written a melody line and then not forced music over it, but you know what I, where I'm coming from. I always find that the pantonal way is much more, well, again, it's where my ear gravitates to first, like you mentioned. Yeah. And even when I get to that point in the process, like where I've written a chord progression and then I want to sit down and try to figure out how I can get some lyrical overflow going. I rarely think of the melodic thing at that point either. And I'm more interested in the rhythm or the prosody of the phrase of words, mm -hmm. almost like it's a snare solo on the drum, the lyrical, you know, what's going on with the melody line for me, the rhythmic events of the melodic construction are more important to me than the value of the notes. Mm -hmm. But I'm, you know, I'm not a singer with a huge range. There are other people in the world that I think have more fun combining range with prosody of phrase to create pop music like someone like taylor swift you know who i think writes from that point of view a lot where they come up with a hook they like and then they create something melodically and rhythmic right within that hook then they get together with a producer and suss out harmonic stuff after the fact you know yeah no no i fully agree all right and 
So, um, your idea so why don't you talk about your difference between um, free writing and, um, and prescribed stuff? Yeah, so the, um, the one idea that I, and again, this kind of comes to me more as in free writing, but there's two different ways to kind of approach this. Free writing would be kind of a stream of consciousness way of writing. You don't really have an, an idea, but you kind of just go for it. I mean, this was very common in creative writing, for instance. You know, we used to have a class back in high school that was, you know, that would be basically be just stream of consciousness and then try to refine it after the fact. Whereas specifically objective writing would be you're picking a topic, like we mentioned earlier, whether it's rain or kale, and then kind of <laughs> directing your song around that. You know, yeah. I mean, we, for, um, for uh, our collaboration song that, the VAMS community did. We specifically decided to kind of, you know, it was right after the pandemic had come around. Our topic was going to be on kind of the feeling of isolation during this period. So we kind of were objective in that, in that kind of, well, that subject matter. And so I, I guess there's benefits to both sides of things. Again, I think the objective writing is much more of, it's a good way to kind of practice or hone your songwriting craft. Whereas yeah, free totally. writing lets you be expressive and then it, you kind of like a happy mistake. You know? I completely agree. And I would say that uh, I, in my own experience of writing, I prefer to start with the free writing process and then retrofit it with an objective writing scaffold. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll, you know, and I think that back in the day, like I think, um, you know, when, when pop music stopped being the realm of, uh, the Brill building and people like prescribing formulaic kind of constraints to music. Yeah. Um, and uh, someone like Bob Dylan came along writing songs, which had a lot of like free, um, uh, I guess, uh, free improv, you know, stream of consciousness kind of ideas. Yeah. Those were ideas that were prompted by poets at the time. You know, I think it was a lot like Allen Ginsberg would have, you yeah. know, written in a free flowy kind of way and then gone back and refined his invention to get to something like Howell. And I think Dylan was the same way about a lot of his early long compositions. You know, I think he did the same thing where he just like Bleh, got it all out and then went back and was like, no, it ain't me, babe. No, 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 it ain't me, babe. You know, it's it turned it into a song by simplifying some of the ideas and coming up with um, motivic ideas based on the phrasing that could be repeated and be familiar to the listener. So it's the listener isn't having to listen to a song that's reinventing itself every moment. You know, it's like you want the listener to be able to understand that you've got specific motivic ideas that you're resting your idea on, you know, like a, a verse structure will repeat itself. A chorus structure will actually be something revisited as well. Mm -hmm. A bridge will be something that the listener can get a bit of a breather from the other two things, you know, yeah, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm going getting tangential. No, 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 not a, no, no, not at all. No, it's those are all very valid points. I, I, I'm just. I, I also wanted to make, I guess, a distinction with the free writing versus objective. At least this was this is my process, which people can either agree with it or not. But what I found really works for me is, again, I would come up with the harmonic content first and rhythmic. And then it's funny because that'll actually inform if I'm going to do, say, like free writing or objective writing. Right. And there can be yeah. a combination of both because yeah. I mean, one piece that came to mind, it was more, again, kind of a darker piece. And then it's kind of, I don't know why it popped in my head, but that it, it became objective by talking about, you know, media. You know, right. that's, that was kind of my conscious you know that it fit the mood i felt for the piece yeah exactly you know you can i think i think the i think writing a song all the elements can kind of cross pollinate with each other and influence other elements like if you start by writing chords um the chords you choose and the rhythm might influence the idea that you do your free writing on because it evokes a certain emotion in you and then maybe your melody gets informed by that story yeah. And then maybe 
you actually go back and change a couple of chords because now you've actually evoked certain things that have led you back to say, nah, that chord doesn't really do it justice. Like, and then at that point you can go and you can refine all the other elements. You know what I mean? It's like dominoes always kind of, the snake always eats yeah. its own tail yeah. when you start writing a song, man. No, so that, yeah, I think, again, there's like, it's subjective on which way you want to go about it, but it's always totally. ever changing. And that's the thing about songwriting as well is that it's not like, I, I, it's very rare I think that you kind of have I mean and it does happen like the song that comes to mind is Neil Young's Ohio where I guess he wrote that and within two days they had it recorded and I think yeah. with, like less than a week it was out on the radio yeah. but as as kind of like a visceral protest to what was actually going on in in the states with yeah. regards to sentiments towards the Vietnam War yeah. so it was yeah so, I mean, it can happen like that, but I mean, it's an ever-changing beast. It's not like, I mean, yeah. most, unless, you know, there's certain people that can do it that way, but yeah, it's not. And like I'm pretty sure that within the process of Neil going through all that, I'm sure he had set phrases at the beginning that he was hinching everything on, like four dead in Ohio. Yeah. And maybe he wrote something that was fast at first and had to slow it down to get to the point where the prosody of phrase worked for his lyrics, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you want it heavy and rocky. Maybe it was a bit too light at first on the acoustic guitar. Maybe when they got to the studio and started playing things, the production values started influencing, you know, the tempo and the choice of things for harmonies in the chorus and stuff like who yeah. knows? Like everything informs everything else. It's kind of the beautiful thing of how amorphous songwriting is. You know, everything, yeah. everything can, everything kind of holds its own veto in the moment, depending on what you gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and evolving all the time. So, I guess do we also want to talk? I guess that we were going to talk a little bit about ear training at the end here. Yeah, when it uh, informs, yeah, the melody. So again, this is another tool to kind of help you in your process, I guess. When this is more of a tool than specifically dealing with melody, but um, ear training for myself, um, ear training again, and this is probably why maybe I have a bit more difficulty with writing melodies, is it, it, it didn't come naturally to me. I always have to work at it. And you know, I, when I was in school, we had ear training courses that you know if, if it was something where i had to study equations or know about signal flow for mixes or critical listening things like that that was always easy for me i'd study for hours on my ear training if i had to test the next day because i was just not as confident about that area of my musical right. ability right so i mean i'd say ear training really also helps you inform you know where where you should sit in your melody yeah and i think that it also um if you build that muscle up in your ear it allows you to be able to fully realize ideas that maybe you're hearing certain things out of the blue without you know prescribing them to harmony or melody at that point and it allows you a chance for your ear to tell you where you should be going in that regard if you can if you're good with hearing intervals or the textures of certain chord values and things like that. Like, you know, immediately you're like, oh, I'm hearing a minor chord or I'm hearing a major chord or I'm hearing a, a dominant chord. Like being able to make those distinctions to yourself as you're sitting there trying to pound out something on the fretboard on your guitar. Yeah. You know, you kind of, I've had an instance, funnily enough, I, I wrote a song called um, Pain in the Night when I first got out of uh, rehab. And it took me years after writing that song to realize that I had, I had been neglecting the chord that I was really hearing in the, um, the B part, okay. which was, uh, it was played as a minor chord for most of the song, except in that one moment in the B part where I needed it to be a major chord. Okay. And it, it, it totally was like counterintuitive. You know, I, I wouldn't have arrived there with a sane mind had I been just thinking of the math of harmony. But then when I stumbled across it, I was like, oh my God, that's why I couldn't find that chord. It's because I was like, it had to be minor because it's always minor in the song. And it was like, no, in that moment, it's gotta be major. And I think ear training gives you the confidence to be like, oh, my ear called on that chord. I need to find a different one, you know? Yeah. I think that it builds your confidence in making decisions. 
Yeah, and so that's again it, like what we talked about earlier. Necessarily, like you can invert the chord to what you would naturally expect it to be. Right, exactly. Or add extensions that give it a whole other texture than what you initially bargained for. You know, you start adding elevenths and thirteenths and nines and like yeah. things get crazy. Yeah. You know, piano players have an easier time with that because the piano is more tempered. But yeah. I gotta stop swearing when we do these shows. <laughs> no I know you keep writing it down. You're like bleep there, bleep there, bleep there. Hopefully, people will enjoy a little bit of sandpaper with their learning. I know, right? No, I, we just gotta be PG with everything, right? Sorry, man. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. So, okay, we've talked about that. Oh, and I just want to touch on. So <laughs> this is an important lesson. Even the disabled swear. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, right? It's a, it's a little known. It's a myth that's now a fact. Acquiring a disability is not a purity test. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing that I'm going to touch on with the ear training is another resource that I'll put in on, um, I'll put in uh, in the comment section is there's a website called Toned Ear. Nice. That I, again, um, I work with, with clients up at GF Strong. And even just for myself as a musician, it's a great resource just to kind of, you know, they have naming scales, chord progressions, you know, um, even if it's just, you know, triads, different triads, major, minor, diminished, augmented. Um, it's really just a great resource that actually is in the last, I've really been kind of using it a bit more in the last couple of years. And it's, I can tell it's actually improved even just my ear in general for hearing things. And even, you know, using whatever instrument you have, um, if you can keep it tuned, no, seriously, it's an important distinction. Not everyone knows, know, you know, your piano will stay tuned for the most part, but you're going to have to tune a guitar or a ukulele on a regular basis. Oh yeah. But using those as references to practice singing to, yeah. you know, creating little melody lines and then singing along with them and listening to the note values and seeing, okay, am I singing that correctly? Is that the space that I want between those two notes? That just helps the tools that you have available to you for getting good ear training done, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think our last section that we're going to talk about today, and I alluded to it a little earlier to, in the session, but form. Form. Right. So. All right. Do you want me to do my blah, blah again? Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you go into it? All right, so I'm going to break this down into various subgroups. Um, I would say that when we're talking about writing songs, we're talking about creating structures that are modular, meaning that they're their own kind of constructs that show up in the song and repeat themselves and distinguish themselves from the other sections. And we give these titles like the verse is, you know, the, the verse part of a song the chorus is the hooky part of the song that you kind of you know always go back to in your mind yeah. and then there are other sections known as bridges or pre-choruses that are a bridge or a segue between those two sections mm -hmm. all right that being said verse verse structures this tends to be the this tend to be the forms of the song where the majority of the story is told so you know if you have kind of a yarn you're trying to get out there about a guy that gets in his car that drives to another country and builds a house and has a family and grows a thousand years old or whatever that story is going to require many verses to be able to get that story out in a way that's poetic and engaging for a listener mm -hmm. chorus these become where both a lyrical and melodic idea are fully realized for the listener often the libretto here is what one might call anthemic or the hook both a strong lyric and a melodic motif that listeners gravitate towards. You know that thing that you might find yourself humming after you hear a song you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can come up with a million examples of that. Graham, go for it. What are the hooky choruses that you have in your brain? Well, the one that came to mind, and it's mainly because we did it for the dissecting hit songs, but the um, Miley Silas track, Wrecking Ball. At right. that end there, right? As we kind of analyze that a lot. That was the and first one that came to mind. As it jumps up that octave. I came yeah. in like a wrecking ball. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It needs exactly. the clutch fist rock yeah. singing. Yeah. The anthem. The yeah, anthem. exactly. So, yeah, that, I mean, I mean, yeah, We Will Rock You. 
yeah or even you know all in all you're just uh, another brick in the wall that's like that that's hammered home as well or you know um any of the monkeys music or beatles music you know twist and shout or norwegian wood or i mean pretty much something everything on all their albums yeah There's something in there yeah they always knew how to get the hook in oh yes yeah <laughs> All right, so um, an interesting saying that is used in formulaic writing, especially in places like Nashville, mm -hmm. and the myriad of independent singer-songwriters that inform the pop milieu, um, is don't bore us, get to the chorus. So yeah. if you're writing a long yarn about stuff, you know, don't make it like, you know, something from don't make it like the Iliad by Homer, you know, like you need to actually, there needs to be something that the listener can return to that's repetitive motivically that grounds them within what the, uh, you know, the desired meanings should be for the listener against the construction. So, you know, you want to have like a verse at the beginning, then play your chorus so that the listener gets to hear the landscape of the devices you're going to be using. And then you can manipulate those two things to get the desired kind of tensions and releases that you want going forward, you know? Now, an interesting distinction though that we should make too is that some pieces actually start with the chorus. That's true. To begin with. So it's even, you know, they, they might even just hit you with it right away. Yeah. Instead of, you know, even waiting a verse or an intro as well. Yeah, definitely there was a lot of that going on in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to, for some reason off the top of my head, I can't think of one. Well, I would say that uh, probably a great example of that in out of the 70s punk movement would be the Ramones' I Want to Be Sedated. Right. That right. comes out right with 20, right. 20, 24 hours to go. Yeah. I want to be sedated. That, and yeah. that's basically the chorus idea, you know? Yeah, in and out and like, how long is that song? Like two minutes and 12 seconds? Maybe. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I remember reading a show that, uh, or reading about a show that they played and they were done in like, their whole set in 20 minutes because they like oh, yeah. sped everything up than what they were actually going to play it at. So yeah. yeah, just funny little aside there. And yeah, so I mean, yeah. I guess it just, it really depends. To, and again, I guess it's also this intention of what type of piece of music you're writing as well. Like, again, if you're going for that very radio friendly hit, get to the chorus quickly but in the back of my head as well and i'll again i'll use this as an example but look at um pink Floyd shine on you crazy diamond right <laughs> you know there's like a good like seven minutes of just solos and yeah. things at the beginning yeah there's like s seven different sections to that song right yeah exactly yeah. So it's that an epic so and once again um if sorry i'll just reiterate that um stylistically in terms of what kind of um, form you want, not talking even about the chords, but the way you put the form together of the song, there are a lot of tried and true formulas that people have adhered to over the years. Back in the early Broadway blues, kind of jazz uh, musics of, you know, from the 20s up through the 60s, one could say that the form relied on uh, something called AABA, which is essentially verse, verse, um, variation on verse or chorus verse as a structure. Um, and then that that kind of uh, matured into something more complex once people like the Beatles came around and then you were getting like verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse. Like, um, you know, there were all of a sudden these middle eights and these pre-choruses and bridges and stuff that people were using. And it was like, well, where's, you know, it wasn't it wasn't as laid out as just like, the way someone would sing Misty in a jazz band, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, the form and evolved too. And, you know, you can even have a D part, like an A, you know, A, B, C, or like D, yeah. like and even another like outro that's totally different than anything prior that you've heard before. But yeah, yeah, and they're often, um, when people are talking about those sections, when they're breaking them down, they, they will still use the letter A, but they'll be like, there's an A and an A prime and an A second, you know, and, and there's variations on the verse form here. Yeah. And then, so the, again, I will touch, I, again, briefly mention this, but so I guess there is an art to writing a two minute and 30 second song, three minute 
song versus a seven minute song. Yes. But also just to give listeners examples, you can actually have say a seven minute song and then do what's called a radio edit and cut that down into what is a, you know, two and a half, three minute song. An example um, that I have is from, you know, a band called Death Cab for Cutie and um, my heart shall go on. I think that's the track or something around that, but Regardless, it, it's actually like a seven minute piece. It has a beautiful right. piano opening, then kind of like a different kind of variation on that piano outro. But, you know, the, the one that's on the radio is two minutes and 30 seconds. You know, it goes right. right into the piece. I think it's like you get the last four measures of that piano kind of interlude, and then right. you're right into the verse. Right, right, yeah, exactly. I even think that, uh, you know, they're through history, a lot of the bands that created songs that were on a long playing LP, the hit 45 signal that was made for radio play was a different edited version that was usually less than how it appeared in the long playing vinyl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that that's, and I guess just if, if you're, you don't necessarily need to pigeonhole yourself to writing something that short, even if yeah. you go that you can edit your stuff down as well, but yeah, more commercial and, friendly. And I find even um, talking about the process of doing original singer songwriting is that when I'm recording a CD, usually when I get to the mixing part, I'm still writing the song. Yeah. And there'll be moments where I'm listening back to the play and being like, well, can we take that whole chorus and actually change where it is or move that bridge or cut that guitar solo in half or just do a half a verse in that section? And it's a great editing tool for, you know, sculpting out an arrangement you prefer, even if it means you might have to go back and re-record certain parts. Mm -hmm. It's great to use it. It's, you can be in writing mode all the way up to when you decide to master. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Oh, I, I remember working on your project. I remember Paul, I think he wanted to take out, I can't remember what part of what song. Right. I think it was The Spill, maybe, or? The Spill was a nightmare to hobble together. Man. It was really <laughs> tough. That was tough. I couldn't. I couldn't get comfortable with any of that, you know. Yeah, it yeah. was weird. It, the, I mean, what it finally appeared on the CD was a, a great deal of editing that both you and the person who mixed the record had to go through to make that thing stretch an extra beat during one section without <laughs> sounding like the band was drunk. Yeah, <laughs> that was, that was Dave. David was that the mix engineer? Yeah, David J. Taylor. Yeah. yeah okay. All right. Well, I think we'll probably cut that off here for today. So, you know, we'll leave our listeners wanting more because we're not done yet. <laughs> we're not, we're done, not yet. done yet. Yeah. So, the... sorry. No, no, go ahead. No. So um, we'll, uh, we'll have to stay tuned for the part two of songwriting. Uh, it should be out probably in the next couple of weeks after this one is released, but uh, thanks for joining us and thank you for, you know, giving all your insights into songwriting, Simon. Oh, man, thank you for having me, Graham. And it was fun to kind of get together and kind of work on this with you. I look forward to our final installation. Yeah, that'll be great. All right. So stay tuned to connect together for more content from the Disability Foundation and specifically VAMS for content for the VAMS Mini School. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe and take care. Bye. Cheers.